-hmm. If you think that you're perfect, then you're not going to improve your knowledge. You're not going to question yourself. But you have to open yourself to the possibility, huh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm stupid, maybe there's something missing. And then you learn something and you loop and you improve yourself, right? Yeah. So epic, epistemic humility helps you improve your knowledge. Uh, welcome, everybody, to another episode. Uh, my guest today is Seth from uh, Transcendent Philosophy. Uh, he likes Hello. to pres- Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of, like, a, a sentence to describe that. Like, you like to discuss ideas to solve problems and help people transcend biases. And, and you've studied some philosophy as well, so got some philosophies of men mingled with scriptures that's good exactly yeah so <laughs> the whole the, my uh take on philosophy is uh sometimes philosophers get overly bogged down in the details and they don't actually make the world a better place mm-hmm. and i'm trying like tr- the word transcend basically signifies you know we're at a certain level and we want to get to a better level and so i'm trying to figure out a way to use philosophy you know to get us to a better place it seems like a cool project so um i want to ask you more about that first i kind of wanted to give uh listeners your background um i like i'm currently an atheist and um but you know i had a i had a faith journey uh i was a very strong true believing mormon like from the age of nine i thought that i had a hundred percent confidence that you know god was real I had lots of spiritual experiences, Uh, the doctrine, it made sense to me, like my life experiences correlated with the principles of the gospel, everything seemed to fit in place. I was like, it has to be true. Like, I'm the chosen elect that got to be born, to be raised, to have this truth, and I got to share this with the world. I was so convinced it was true, and like, uh, like it was my job to be a missionary and to, you know, gather in the flock before the world burns, you know, I was totally bought in. And then after my mission, like, whereas prior, like, you know, things in my life happened and they fit with the paradigm. But after my mission, things in my life started to happen to me that didn't really fit with the paradigm. And it, like the questions is like, well, you know, if you do good things, you get blessed. Well, that didn't happen. And if you are, if you leave the church, you're evil. Well, that didn't happen. And like all these conflicting things started coming to my attention. Just the weight and the pile of contradictions grew more and more until, you know, a faith crisis and whatever. Okay. So what, what was it that triggered that? I'm curious, like what was, yeah, yeah. yeah it's kind like it's 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 often like it's often you know kind of a fallacy to say there's like one thing like it's kind of like a you know the shelf metaphor it's there's a lot of things that contribute it contribute to it but it's like that last thing is like the tip of the iceberg that kind of knocks it over yes you know what i mean but for me like uh a lot of a lot of things revolving career revolving uh, dating, revolving marriage, revolving uh, like um, like locate like where I wanted to work, like location of my career, like lots of like life planning, right? Like I had ideas for my life plan. Seemed like God had different ideas. There was all these contradictions, and yeah, those were those were kind of the main themes of it. Oh, that's interesting. That's not like a normal story. Usually it's some (laughs) kind of, I don't know. It just seems that seems, it's it's very big picture. Like there were just things happening in your life that made you start to actually think about what your fundamental beliefs were. Like there was just things in life happening that were making you analyze. You're like, this isn't lining up with what I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can quickly give like the last final straw, which is the most easy to explain. 
um, but it's a little bit um, it's a little bit personal. Hmm. But it was uh, basically it was my marriage, and I was strongly considering like a divorce. And to me, it was like this, you know, the marriage, like I made a mistake. I was a dumb 23 year old. This was not good for my well-being and probably wasn't good for her well-being. Like it was better. Like we, we chose the wrong people. We should separate. Right. Um, and like I thought like my logic, my emotion, everything said this was the right decision. And like God's opinion was the opposite. Like I heard a voice from God basically say, don't divorce her. And I was like, what? And so I was like, like divorce equals maximize well-being. And then for like six months, I like tried to make the marriage work and nothing made sense. It was like, this isn't good. Like we're, and eventually I just came to the conclusion, like either God is dumb because that, that's a bad, this is a bad idea. Or God is like, malicious like he's trying to harm our well-being or like maybe like satan is even more powerful than god and like satan is masterminding all these revelations and like god is too weak to like contradict satan's you know illusions and then the fourth conclusion is like maybe god doesn't even exist and you're just hallucinating and you're making up narratives and like you need to stop this whole you know, spiritual game because you're just you're just messing up your life decisions by believing in imaginary voices. You know what I mean? Oh man! So that makes it so when you do make the decision to, I'm assuming you got the divorce, right? Yeah. So yeah. you make you make that decision, and then all of a sudden, like, you, <laughs> oh man, what a trip! Because then you'd be second guessing yourself too, because you're like, oh. Like, cause you, you do play mind games with yourself when you're on that tipping point of like trying to make the decision. Yeah. I, I felt that too. So, um, all right. So now tell me about your, your project, your transcendent philosophy. How did that start up? Um, yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I basically, you know, I left the church and like my well being like shot through the roof cause I was like so depressed in the marriage like everything was awesome after I like, I basically divorced and left the church at the same time. It okay. was simultaneously very traumatic and simultaneously very freeing. And I could finally do what I wanted. I didn't have to do the career God wanted me to do. I could do the career I wanted to do. You know, I didn't have to be with the person God wanted me to be with. I could be, you know, I could have my own life path. My destiny was mine once more. I no longer needed to submit my will to his will. And, but then it was, there was this, all of that freedom, it put a lot more responsibility on me and like, actually figure out what's the right thing. You know, it's like, what is the correct morality absent God? What is the correct, you know, relationship absent? You know, I lost all of these guiding, you know, uh, all like a, like maybe a Chesterton's fence or like a guiding pathway, the, the blinders of religion that guide the horse, you know, once you're freed, you've got a lot more power, a lot more information, but you've got the freedom to make bigger mistakes. And so it required more wisdom, right? I had to level myself up to take on the responsibility of not having, you know, having the, I'm trying to think of the right analogy, like, what, what's what's the word for like um, kids that are swimming and they, they got the floaties like like kid in a variety safety of situations. Net. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The religion kind of provides a safety net for like stupid children. Like, don't do that thing. Don't do that <laughs> thing. Right. But when you grad, yeah, it kind of feels like a little bit of a graduation. But there, it you have to kind of take that seriously because it's a, you know it's a challenge to actually you know do the right thing in complex situations. Right. And so you, so you got into reading philosophy then, and you're fascinated, you're trying to figure out how to do this for yourself. And then along the way, you're like, I think I should share this with people. This is good information. <laughs> yeah. So that transition, like those two things that are happening at the same time, like my health was slowly declining and my interest in philosophy was slowly uh, increasing 
and those are probably causally related, but I can't articulate why very well. Hmm. But um, yeah, I, I, ha I started having more and more health problems. And um, it kind of came to the point where I was like almost bedridden, you know, like I like lots of back pain. Like I would go to work for eight hours. I'd just be in back pain all day, just completely inflamed. I'd come home and I just have to lay on the couch for like hours upon hours trying to recover. Hmm. And like I couldn't do anything. I'm just lying like <laughs> And so I would just turn on like these philosophy podcasts and I would just like consume, consume, consume. And you know, when, when it feels like your whole world is collapsing, like your health is like, you're getting closer and closer to disabled, less and less productive at work. You're, you know, getting ready to get laid off because you know, you can't, you can't function when you're just so bad off. And you know, you can't date if you're just like bedridden and like every, you know, every possible, you know, everything in my future that I wanted was slowly like disappearing as my health plummeted. Mm. And like this big question like kept coming up is like, you know, what's the meaning of life if you lose everything that you wanted? You know what I mean? What's the meaning of life if you're just bedridden and in pain? Like, if, if every minute of your existence is bedridden and being tortured, why not just kill yourself? Like, mm -hmm. what exactly are you living for? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so that was a really powerful question that I had to confront on a daily basis for about a year. Wow. And um, I finally came to like an epiphany that was part of me, you know, you could say transcending, like transcending a paradigm to a new paradigm. Right. Okay. Yeah. And well, tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. How did you, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of people that kind of go through that and they don't even have the health problems on top of it, but I can't imagine going through that mental anguish of the essentially dark night of the soul, right. On top of, of actual health problems too, that you can't even like, um, even distract yourself or, you know what I mean? Like sometimes yeah. I feel like I'm just distracting myself with like autopilot stuff. Right. But if you, yeah. if your autopilot is broken, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And having an autopilot, you know, don't want that to be broken. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically um, during this period, I was, uh, I was, I was basically thinking a lot well, I was listening to a lot of Jordan Peterson. He was really inspiring to me because he talked a lot about suffering, right? And, you know, I have, I have my disagreements with Jordan Peterson. I don't really like a lot of his political takes, but, like, during this period of suffering for me, like, he's got hours upon hours of content, you know, about suffering and meaning and transcending suffering. I was kind of captivated trying to figure this out, like, does any of this apply to me? You know what I mean? And he kind of brought up some interesting points, some ways to think about, you know, Christianity in slightly different ways, you know. Um, and on my podcast, I have, a, I have a video called Philosophy of Suffering, where I go in detail on my philosophic journey of learning how to accept my suffering. So, you know, I probably won't be able to flesh it out as in-depth here, um, so you can check out if you want uh, more details, but um, yeah, basically, I was I was trying to like uh, the Christian message was that Jesus he accepted his suffering, and Jordan Peterson said when you accept your suffering, you simultaneously transcend it, right? And so I was like, hmm, that seems really important, but what does it mean to accept your suffering? What does it mean to transcend it? And Jesus was the metaphor, like he carried his own cross, he didn't complain, you know, he, he voluntarily, you know, progressed through this suffering. And he didn't, you know, he, he wasn't a quitter, you know, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't trying to evade it or be bitter about it. And there were elements of uh, 
those elements of meaning, right? Like the meaning was he was doing it for other people. And so that kind of stuck to me. But, you know, I didn't really feel like, I didn't feel like it was a good enough explanation, right? I was kind of overwhelmed with how unfair it was. I was like, how could God create such an unjust universe? Like, like just randomly, oh, you got some genes, your back is crooked with scoliosis, and now you're going to be tortured for the rest of your life, and I'm just going to increase your torture. Every year the torture is going to get higher and higher until I finally succeed in getting you to torture yourself. Ha ha ha. Sounds like a, like a, like a villain's master plan for creating the most evil universe possible. And so, like, my faith in God, like, it didn't disappear immediately, you know? I was, like, I was wrestling with the concept of God for years and years, you know? Yeah. And so I was getting closer and closer to atheism, but I kept, like, a percentage. Like, maybe there's a percentage he's there, but I was like, if he's there, he's a really callous and awful God. Like, how can he just let this happen, right? I was getting a little bit bitter about the structure of the universe because mm -hmm. I felt like such a victim of cosmic randomness. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I kind of came to this point where I had to shift my perspective. And I, I've been writing in my blog about wisdom lately. And there's a, an important concept that I've been articulating, which is the concept of humility. And I, I, I've uh, split, this is probably too much detail for this episode, so you, uh, you can check out my blog for <laughs> You're fine. For, for that, but basically... Which, which, what, which concept? So tell me the video and I can kind of link them um, in the notes. I haven't made a video for it. I, I'm, I'm working on the blog. I do my blog first and then I convert it to a video. So oh, cool. It's currently in blog phase. It's uh, what is wisdom is the topic. Okay. But, um, I, I'm building a model where self-improvement, uh, the, the catalyst for self-improvement is humility. And there's two types of self-improvement. There's like epistemic self-improvement and there's moral self-improvement. And so like Socrates, he said, you need to have epistemic humility. You need to understand that you don't know anything. And so that type of, that type of knowledge humility that gives you the catalyst for learning and improving, right? Mm -hmm. If you think that you're perfect, then you're not going to improve your knowledge. You're not going to question yourself. But you have to open yourself to the possibility, huh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm stupid, maybe there's something missing. And then you learn something and you loop and you improve yourself, right? Yeah. So epic, epistemic humility helps you improve your knowledge. And moral humility is like the Christian humility you need to say, I am morally imperfect. You know, I'm, all people are sinners. I need to accept that I'm not as morally good as I could be. And that moral humility opens you up to a repentance cycle where you improve yourself morally, right? Mm -hmm. So those are two aspects of what wisdom is in that blog. Okay. So, so um, like Jordan Peterson was talking about the importance of epistemic humility and, you know, I was kind of getting really confident in the idea that this universe is evil. Like, every day I'm getting tortured, my life is falling apart, I'm like, this universe sucks. Like, any universe that randomly tortures people, that's evil. Like, I didn't do anything to deserve this. And, like, other people are getting tortured by different diseases. I can't, you know, I can't just say, oh, they deserve that. Like, really? That's such a, I hate that perspective, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of... There's a lot of, you know, religious mentality that blames the sufferer, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like, and there's a, there's a big problem with that. And reli uh, religion frustrates me because scriptures, there's so much scripture, right? You've got all these scriptures and like, like Jesus, like people can find loopholes with scriptures. Like if you try to say religion promotes, you know, blaming the victim of suffering. Like, I could accuse religion of that. And then the theist would be like, no, because Jesus said, like, uh, the blind person, he wasn't uh, guilty, like, of doing anything. He was just unlucky to be born blind. Right? Like, Jesus says that is his, you know, Jesus undoes that narrative, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But like you have to, in my opinion, when you look at a religious text, you have to look at the preponderance of evidence, right? Like maybe there's three verses of scripture that say those who suffer are not deserving of it. And then there's like 97 verses of scripture that say those who suffer are deserving of it. And so on the balance, the entire corpus, you know, the entire religious text, it has a 97% bias to blame people as you deserve your suffering. You mm. know what I mean? Can I touch on that a little bit? Yeah, go, go for that. So it's interesting. Uh, I was actually talking to my husband about this. We were talking about after our collapse of belief and when did we feel good? And, you know, we, we kind of decided, well, it wasn't like this moment where all of a sudden we were better, right? It's just always gradually getting better and better all the time. And, um, but I have like different, it was almost like steps. Like there's different things that have helped me and different like mindsets that I've adopted when, when or epiphanies. Say, I think you said getting better. What context are we talking about? Like just getting over the loss and just not feeling peace of mind. Yeah. And just being, just accepting that mm. that's your upbringing and this is where you are now and your family's still in it and just kind of being okay with that. Like this is your lot in life and it's really not that bad. Maybe like, I don't know, <laughs> maybe it is really bad for other people. I don't know, but I, um, there was an epiphany that I had that actually helped me heal a lot. And it was that I wanted to blame the church for hiding things from me. I wanted to blame the church um, for keeping me naive or encouraging me to be naive anyway. Like maybe they didn't force me to yeah. do that. Like I had access to the internet all along, right? Yeah. I was choosing not to look at certain things. Um, and so but, when I, but why do you know, they're programming I, I, you to not look? I and... do. I, I'm not aloof to that, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, once I accepted my own part in it, for example, there were snakes, there were dragons that I ignored along the way and I just brushed them under the rug. And it's like those analogies that you hear about, the dragon growing and getting bigger and things got worse, not better. Like the things you ignore, you don't address them. It just, it gets worse. It gets bigger. The problem doesn't go away. And so part of me not incorporating a more, a belief that was more in line with reality was the fact that I was ignoring things. And some of that, it, I was never taught to address the dragons, right? Like I was almost taught, like that that was a good thing <laughs> to, mm. to, to ignore some of these things and to just have faith. Right. But when I, when I decided that I, there were things that I could have done to avoid as big of a fall as I had, it actually helped me heal. Like I was like, it's not like there is some cabal or anything like that. This is a whole body of believers that believe this thing. And that's what they believe reality is. I don't believe it aligns with reality, but that they do believe it. And so given that they do believe it, they're not doing anything wrong. So to blame people that aren't doing anything wrong, isn't helping me. <laughs> like, like, I don't know. Like, so just for me yeah. taking responsibility for my own part in it actually helped a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to remember what you said in the beginning that even took me to that uh, thought. Hmm. Cause you were talking about we were talking about yeah. the Bible and how the yeah. Bible has this many verses that say that it's yeah. your fault, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess I feel like when your mindset, I understand that can, how do I word this? Oh, uh, you you're basically saying if that's a helpful bias sometimes. It is a true thing. Like how many problems in individuals lives are caused by their own actions? right? Yeah. Like in your situation, it clearly is not <laughs> like, like health problems. And so I think maybe those ideas can get twisted into something that's clearly not true, but, yeah. but it is 
true a lot that a lot of the times when you are having issues in your life, it's because of your own shortfalls and you're not doing things you already know you should not be doing. Does that make sense? Like, yes. yes. So it's probably why they're there, but yeah, but that, that's like, um, that's like a wise perspective on reality. That's like a, <laughs> that's like a, that's like, so my, my issue is that the religious mentality makes believers think that if you're sick, it's because you deserve to be sick. Yeah. Like, like, you know, if your marriage falls apart, maybe you deserve that. Like a rational person can come to that conclusion, but it's yeah. not, it's not rational to say that you deserved your illness. But I agree. religion makes a lot of people jump to that conclusion. You know, you I mean? said, you said a lot of people, I'm curious, like if we went and did a poll and we went to a Sunday school class yeah. and we said, you know, this person got cancer. How many of you think that was because of a sin they did? I don't think it's a, that high of a percentage. Do you? Well, well, it depends. Are they an ex-Mormon atheist who speaks against God and therefore got cancer? Uh, or is it a Mormon who's just having a trial of their faith? <laughs> okay, so now you're going into the whole idea of uh, comparing like our my best to your worst, right? The, like it's the that's the bias. The interpretation is in... extremely biased. Yes. It's the the you know, the causal relationship is completely, you know, yes, they that's can definitely make they can figure out a narrative to make anything fit their paradigm. That's right. That's yeah. confirmation bias at its best. And you say they, and it's actually we. It's all of us, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Hopefully some people, you know, hopefully there's a spectrum where some people, you can, hopefully there's ways to be less vulnerable to it than, you know, than before. I, th I think the best way is to talk to people that, don't align with your views, like to stay out of echo chambers. I think that's really maybe the only way because <laughs> I don't think I'm above it. Yeah, I think that's a huge, yeah, that's, I strongly agree with that. That's a huge aspect of, like uh, you said before, transcendent philosophy is all about this, like yeah. overcoming biases, like confirmation bias is one of the things we have to transcend. Yeah. And yeah, I, I'm strongly in the camp of the dialectic, talking to people you disagree with, is basically the philosophic dialectic, two different perspectives, and how do we contradict and how do we transcend the contradiction to a more accurate understanding of reality, right? Yeah. Well, and, and even in that back and forth that we just had, I think ultimately, I don't think we changed each other's minds or it needed to either. Like, I think that that's a lot of the problem with maybe content online is that you have people cherry picking a portion of something and it's not the whole thing. I don't know. Like you're not, you're not taking in the steel man of what the other person is trying to say basically. And then you try to make it sound terrible, right? Like, I don't know. If that makes yeah. sense. 100%. Uh, that's a huge part of, you know, everything is, yeah, everyone is doing that at every level of analysis, right? Politics, geopolitics, religion, ideology, everything. Yeah. 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 Well, do you want to talk more about, like, the goals of your channel? So it's basically helping, you know, people, helping helping the world transcend biases at basically like three levels of analysis, the individual level, the group level, and the uh, like the national level, the, glo the global level. And so what that translates to is like, um, um, you know, there's like at the geopolitical level, at, like overcoming political biases, overcoming philosophic biases, um, overcoming, you know, uh, the biases, maybe religious biases, ideological biases at the individual level. And that, that combination, hopefully individuals, by overcoming some biases, they can be more harmonious. And then political groups can be more harmonious by overcoming the biases. Nations might be able to become more harmonious. And then like, if all of those levels are becoming harmonious from the bottom up, maybe that's a path to like something like world peace and, you know, well-being and all of that. 
So I really like that idea about, you know, you have this dialectic and you synthesize uh, two different viewpoints for a better viewpoint, right? And it's not like necessarily compromise, right? Because I think yeah. sometimes people are like, well, I don't want to compromise because then I'm losing something. So sure. I don't know. what. How, how can you give people confidence that like there is something better than just compromise? Like what's the difference between like compromising versus like coming to a third conclusion that's actually better than either of the two? Sure, sure. Um, I would, I, I think an easy way to frame this is in terms of percentages. So a compromise would be like a 50-50, right? So we could say like while we're on the topic of religion, we could, uh, a large part of my um, faith journey uh, was the Jordan Peterson versus Sam Harris debates. Did yeah. you ever see those? Oh, yeah. It was like over eight hours of debate. I, I loved it. The first time I watched it, I was leaning, you know, 60% in Jordan Peterson's favor, 40% in Sam Harris's favor. The second time I watched it, I was 60% in Sam Harris's favor, 40% in Jordan Peterson's favor. So that was kind of interesting. Um, so like we could have a proposition, right? We could, the proposition, like one person, so the dialectic is often framed as thesis, which is the, the original argument. Then there's an antithesis, which is the contradicting argument. And then there's the synthesis, which is, you know, the, the mixing of the two. So like you could say Sam Harris, his argument is the thesis. And Sam Harris says you could like, this is a guess, like you could kind of synth reduce his argument down to the phrase, you know, like uh, on the balance, religion is bad for the world and maybe to the degree of 80% bad, 20% good. That, that's kind of the vibe of his argument. Mm -hmm. And then Jordan Peterson, his argument is religion is on the balance good and maybe to the degree of 80% good, 20% bad. Flip-flop the percentages, right? Mm -hmm. And then they have this debate. Is religion as good as you say it is, or is it as bad as you say it is? And they're going back and forth. Right. And so the synthesis, the new conclusion, is like, oh, maybe Sam Harris, he was kind of missing some of this perspective. Like the Bible has inspired lots of people. Like it helps, you know, religious experience helps people overcome addiction. Like maybe there's a few more percentage points of goodness to add back in. And so maybe the new conclusion is, you know, it's more like 60-40 as opposed to 80-20. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're evolving towards a more accurate relationship with the facts as opposed to a more extreme biased relationship with the facts. Instead of one coming out as 100-0. Right, right. Now, okay. if, if, if reality is 100-0, then that's accurate, but that's rare that, it's, that reality is that extreme. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that's interesting. Are, are there things that you feel like you can't synthesize? Like you're pretty confident, your confidence level is high enough that you're not really in, in the market for updating certain beliefs like there's just not any kind of synthesizing that needs to be done like do you have any really firm solid beliefs like that hmm that's a really good question i don't think so like i try to you know i i i, I try to contend with disagreement yeah you know, i for a long time i have actively pursued joining groups like it like online joining groups that i disagree with i've always like from a young age i got incepted with the idea that you know like truth comes through a dialectical debate so hmm. like even at the age of 13 i was like a young earth creationist evolution is false and i'm like well this is so obvious to me that i'm right i gotta do a dialectic with some you know atheistic science oriented people who believe evolution so i'm online finding these science forums i'm like evolution is so dumb and then they're like they're debating with me i'm like oh actually i'm the dumb one you know <laughs> what i mean so i i like and so i'm very much the type of person that is very willing to grapple with the other perspectives mm -hmm. i always 
uh, maybe part of Christianity, like um, I think Paul said something like, always be ready to give an answer to those who question you. You know, there's some, so that kind of a vibe, like I always want to have an answer. And, you know, as I approached, as I started becoming more and more and more atheistic, I like as a, as a religious, you know, as a believer, I had, I had all these answers for why I believed what I believed. But then I was like, well, if I'm going to be an atheist, I need to have answers for why I'm an atheist. So I had to kind of build up a new uh, architecture of, uh, of um, justification. Mm -hmm. hmm. So let's say you run into somebody who is uh, you're in a disagreement with. And I feel like the common place to go is to say, oh, well, they must be ignorant or missing information, or they're not intelligent enough to understand, or they're just bad faith or evil. And really, they don't go outside those three things. It's got to be one of those three things. Do you think there's other things besides those three things that could lead to a disagreement? Can you re uh, restate those three things? So either they're missing information, so they're ignorant, or they're just not smart, they're dumb, unintelligent, they can't understand, or they're bad faith, evil. And this is when you think someone is wrong, the explanation yeah. for why they're wrong? They've come to a different conclusion than you. Uh, let's see. So, hmm. yeah, those are, those are pretty, those are, pretty like those are kind of extreme versions of where you would <laughs> you wouldn't want to go that far you know what I mean usually but that that is a human bias to jump to those conclusions mm -hmm. I think like lots of I think the vast majority of people that are you know that disagree with you are generally good faced um, you know or at least I don't think that like people want to come to wrong conclusions. Like that's a really, I don't think that makes evolutionary sense to have creatures that want to misunderstand reality. You know what I mean? There's definitely yeah. trolls. That's a thing. Right. Uh, yeah. And that is kind of, you know, that, that's kind of the bad faith aspect. I don't think the majority are trolls. Um, I think like, where you're raised, like that, that's kind of a big aspect of your worldview. Your worldview, you know, sets you up with a paradigm of biases and the biases alter how you consume information. And so if you are born in an area that has all of these, you know, biases, then you're going to navigate your information landscape according to those biases. Then you're going to come to wrong conclusions. And it's not like you're trying to come to a wrong conclusion, but you've mm -hmm. just you've just kind of been swimming in the waters that led to those wrong conclusions. You know what I mean? So they are missing information, <sighs> or you think that's different and falls outside of those three things? I'm trying to think how to. This is such a good question. Is it missing information or is it misjudging information? And how do you describe the dis the distinction? So like... Well, actually, could, I think... Go ahead. Sorry. So like a theist could technically be aware that, you know, science says, you know, evolution is real. But then they say, oh, the scientists are evil, therefore they're wrong, therefore evolution is false. Right? So as they're not missing the info. They're just... They're applying... They're, like they're, so then that, uh, that's the third one. They think they're evil. Well, they're not wrong because they are evil. They're wrong because they think sources of our information are evil. So, so th yeah, they don't trust. They don't, they're not trusting um, the same facts, basically. Right. So they don't have the same sources. Conclusions are like how you view the world. Conclusions is based on your epistemology, which ha is how you come to know something. 
and there's different methodologies for how to come to know something. And so it's like, you know, are you using a, like a, a logical deduction or are mm -hmm. you using patterns or are you using cherry picking or are you using these are the good authorities and these are the bad authorities. Right. Mm -hmm. And so a religious paradigm is often these are the good authorities. I trust everything they say and these are the bad authorities. I doubt everything they say. And so if if you're a, if your epistemology doesn't match reality, then you're going to get an incorrect conclusion. Sure. Okay. Uh, I still feel like that is falling in the camp of you feel like someone's missing information. Um, I, guess, miss, I guess I guess one thing that irritates me, I guess the reason I was, uh -huh. I'm, I guess what I was trying to, I was trying to explore is the idea that we assume that it's one of these three things when we're talking to somebody. And I think when we automatically do that, we do ourselves a disservice because then we shut the door for learning something new from that person. Because what's the point of learning something from somebody who is missing information or they're not intelligent or they're just bad faith. So I guess my, I guess my thing is like, well, if someone's come to a different conclusion than me, like maybe I'm the one missing information or maybe I'm the one, you know what I mean? Like, I, I guess, so uh, maybe but that would be, they're not really wrong. They've got something valuable, right? Yeah. Yeah. If and the, the alternative is you're like, I'm the one who's wrong and they're the one who's right. And in, in, or, experiences kind way. of come into it a little bit because I feel like different personalities definitely urge one example of why people experience the world differently. Um, I feel like I have a certain type of personality where I wanted to follow the rules in church where other people seem to be like more like leaning toward like freedom and they want to do all of the things and maybe they're a rule breaker and so the church kind of reins them in a little bit and maybe it's not, maybe that works for that. But for me, it just made me less, like I, I need to like branch out and be a little bit more adventurous, I think, versus like trying to be on the order side of things, um, if that makes sense. So it, it's not just that there's these things that could be true or false, but that it might not be true for everybody kind of a thing. And not, not in a, <laughs> Relative, relativistic kind of a way, but, um, but kind of, uh, I don't think that I, I believe in objective truth in certain things, but there's definitely like this exper experiential type, like what works for people. You know what I mean? I don't oh, know if that's sure. making sense. Yeah. Like, well, like a simple example is like some careers, like make some personalities happy and then mm. like some careers make other personalities unhappy and it's not like either of them are wrong it's just kind of that's a preferential thing right mm -hmm. or yeah even listening to certain uh people it can be motivating for people and other people they're put out of their mind right like you can't you can't predict that i guess that's interesting yeah i think that's a very important um that's a very important uh, paradigm shift, you know, to shift away from the binary, which is I'm right and they're wrong or they're, you know, they're, they're right and I'm wrong. Whereas that shifting towards, you know, like uh, there's kind of a mixture. It's like they're right for some people. I, I'm right for some people or like we've got percentages of rightness and wrongness. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you mentioned something that I found interesting too in your intro video. You talked about getting along with people. Um, and, and you're having a conversation with someone and how, you know, you might be treating someone with respect in their dialogue, but really they don't deserve it. Right. Like yeah. you talked about different levels of communication and how, and sometimes you revert down to other levels. I don't know. Can you explain explain the levels 
maybe and then explain is, an example of is when that the, you... that's the integral paradigm yeah i let me share my oh let me see let me share my screen because i can uh, i have um i've built a little uh useful paradigm about around that okay so uh, I really, uh, in, in thinking about a philosophy of transcendence, I was attracted to the integral model. Uh, the color scheme on the left here is the integral model. It's often formulated as a spiral going upwards. Um, integral theory or spiral dynamics, two different names, the kind of branching theories. There's a lot of different um, psychological uh, paradigms that kind of get mixed. Uh, Ken Wilber was kind of pioneering integral theory. He tried to mix, you know, social like models of sociological cultural evolution and psychological models of like uh, psyche evolution. He tried to mix all of these levels into, you know, he tried to find the overarching patterns and he labeled them as such, right? And so he his, he's positing a theory where that individuals, cultures, you know, nations, humanity, there are stages of leveling up and you can kind of, there's kind of meta patterns that you can kind of see how, how we're leveling up. And so if we're trying to transcend, it's useful to understand these levels so we can say, okay, if, if I am at this level, maybe I need to work on, you know, if I'm at blue, I need to work on orange. If I'm at orange, I need to work on green, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, human bias plays a role. Everyone thinks that they're like, oh, I am the enlightened one at the top of the pyramid. I right. don't need to fix anything. So it, it, you have to approach this pretty humbly. Um, but uh, this, uh, this is an attempt to articulate how conflict can be mapped at the different stages, right? So like uh, at the bottom, we're talking about basic survival instincts, right? From, from an evolutionary perspective, this is the most primal, right? And so if you're just a wild animal, you're just, you're just trying to survive. All you care about is yourself. Everyone else is a threat. And so if, you're, if you see another creature, you're just going to bark and say, get away from me. I, I don't trust you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So this, if you have a survival mentality, you confl your co conflict type is you, you know, you, by yelling, which is mm -hmm. like... A, using like it's a source of power it's your volume like a, a lion his power is in his vocal cords you know like watch out i got lots of you know power behind this roar yeah so it's a it's kind of that uh, power dominance hierarchy mentality right so purple it kind of uh, it, it represents a more complicated uh, more you know complex uh, it begins to mix in uh, a social element right so they often think of this as the tribal stage where we go from individuals to, you know, a family unit or a tribal unit. And like at the tribal level, there's often like, you know, the religion of animism. There's, you know, mystical belief in animal spirits, you know, and um, so the, the superstition starts to get mixed in. And um, so like um, I'm, I'm hypothesizing that, you know, curse words are like, it's a, it's a, a level up from le yelling. You're using, you know, maximally uh, empowered vocabulary to accomplish your uh, conflict. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Maximally offensive words to like deal with the person that you're, you know, struggling with. But then, you know, trying to like get a little bit more sophisticated from there. Uh, red is kind of like dominant, like a like a dominance hierarchy in the sense of like a king, like a king dominates a kingdom, right? Mm. It, it's not like a lion dominating a rabbit. It's more like a king dominating a, a, a nation. And so red is using belittling language to say, I'm above you. You're below me in the hierarchy of this kingdom. I'm the thou and you are the peasant. You know what I mean? Mm hmm and so there's a, a different type of conflict is, I think Trump represents the red dichotomy where he, he's often belittling people in his conflict approach. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like Kim Jong-un, he's got a smaller button than me. 
Mm -hmm. Look at these big hands. Me, big hand, you, small hand. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's very low level sophistication. Uh, Blue goes up a step. Um, So blue is the authority mentality where when um, this is often viewed as kind of the sophisticated religious mentality where like like, uh, you can think of Catholicism, it was able to transcend all of these different states. You know, there was the Roman Empire, all of the, it broke into all these kingdoms, but the Catholic Empire was like a level up on top of all of these nations. Mm-hmm. So the red represented all those different nations. This blue Catholicism was a type of authority that guided people to following the rules to cooperate with each other in this like meta nation, right? So it's a very interesting level of cooperation at Blue where it's about like moral obedience. And so like, for example, the Pope, it's like the Pope is the moral authority. We obey him because he has, you know, communion with God. It's it's, uh, his word is gospel and we all have to follow these specific rules. We're not following the Pope because he's the most powerful with the fist. We're, we're following the Pope because he's the most powerful with the word of God, right? Mm-hmm. And so this blue mentality, it's trying to find obedience to authorities. And then the question is, who is the proper authority, right? And so the question is, who is most in tune with the best set of rules, right? Mm. And so the question is, is the Pope the best authority? Or is Joseph Smith the best authority? Or is Muhammad the best authority? Yeah, it's... Oh, man, that's interesting, because I feel like politics come into that a little bit. Like, our politics have kind of become that realm, right? You have the authority of the political authority. Mm. Right, right. It's interesting. Okay. And so, like, as a missionary, you often hear about Bible bashing. Mm -hmm. That's blue-level conflict, right? The, The Bible bashing is your church does not have authority because this verse, this verse, this verse conflict with Joseph Smith. Okay. It's like, no, your religion does not have moral authority because this verse conflicts with Catholicism, right? We're disputing which authority is most valid. Mm-hmm. Then we get to orange level. Orange represents the enlightenment, modernity, like uh, Kantian philosophy, Humean philosophy. It's kind of the 1700s. It's the philosophy, John Locke. It's all of the stuff that gave birth to the American constitution, like mm-hmm. rights, justice, liberty, um, you know, equality. A lot of these beautiful concepts are modern, right? They mm-hmm. didn't exist during the dark ages of Catholicism. They came in the 1700s. So that's orange level thinking. Um, and so this is where um, you're using debate, right? These philosophers, they're debating the truth, but uh, this debate level of thinking, it turns into winners and losers, where debate becomes kind of a weapon to say, okay, you're the loser of the debate, I'm the winner of the debate, and it kind of gets corrupted a little bit by that ego, right? Mm-hmm. And then green, um, the conflict type, they kind of get to this area of relativism. Um, They're 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 overly focused on empathy, and so they start to view every perspective of equal truth value, and so it's almost that it's kind of this postmodernism. So orange is modernism, Mm -hmm. green is postmodernism, where it's like there is no truth, there is no winner, no loser, there is no right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's like, actually, history is uh, punishing all of these minorities, and therefore the majorities are evil. Minorities are, you know, we have a debt to the minorities, and we need to punish the majorities and, you know, support the minorities to balance out the injustice. Mm -hmm. And so the green conflict type kind of is that, that, uh, that entire, you know, that's kind of largely leftism at this point. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, But then there's yellow, which kind of transcends that relativism. Uh, Yellow is supposed to be an integration perspective, right? 
So yellow is an evolutionary perspective. Yellow is a dialectical perspective. Yellow is a synthesis perspective, right? Dialectic gives you the synthesis. The synthesis is mixing all this stuff together. So mm -hmm. it's like beige needs to mix with purple. Purple needs to mix with red. Red needs to mix with blue. Blue, you know, all of it needs to be mixed together. Like some of it is good, some of it is bad. They complement each other. They balance each other out. Yellow is this complex project of trying to balance all of it together into mm -hmm. a harmonious ideology, right? And so you get like an objective truth and an objective morality that like synthesizes out of this incredibly complex process. And because it's so complex, it's really hard for people to get to this level. And some people aspire to it, you know, like, but it's really hard to like, like I aspire to yellow, but it's like, what's your conclusion then? I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, what's your objective <laughs> conclusion on this? I'm like, eh, I don't know. I can't calculate it. You know right. I mean? um, it's definitely more than a one person uh, solution. <laughs> right, right. And I think the age of AI is going to help us become more yellow because AI is all about synthesizing data. So we can say, synthesize all these perspectives and balance them out into a moral conclusion. Maybe. Right? If you don't break it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to check your weights. Yeah. But if yellow was hard enough to understand, turquoise is even more, you know, esoteric. But I think it approaches like a harmonization. Uh, it approaches a more long-term perspective. So it's like yellow integrates in the short run and maybe turquoise integrates over the, you know, long run. That, mm. That's one way to think about it. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, do you find that, like, when you're looking at these, I I kind of see this pattern on your on your blog in several different places, right? It's not just here, but these ideas kind of map onto other ideas that you have. Do yeah. you ever worry that, like, you're just? I mean, I guess one one time Jordan Peterson said something that I felt like was pretty spot on. Uh, it seems like we're always aiming for the ideal. That's kind of how we as creatures are built. And there's a little bit of safety in the Christian belief where utopia is on the other side of death versus um, more secular societies try to get utopia here on earth and then it turns into like a really big disaster. So like, do you worry about that at all with yeah. uh, like, like, okay, here I'm, I'm looking at this and I don't, I think, I think if I were to say what I am, I'm probably some kind of idealist. Like, I feel like it's good to aim for the best, whatever that is. And I'm not sure what, exactly what that is, but I'm, I try to follow my intuition to do that based on what I know. Right. But at the same time, I get really leery of utopian ideas, I guess, like in a, you know, dystopian kind of thriller kind of way. <laughs> So uh, can you can you just uh, dig deeper into that so I know exactly where you're coming from? Like what type of ideals and like how do you how do you balance having an ideal with being a skeptical slash uh, hesitant slash fearful of utopias? How? Yeah. How do you protect? I, well, let me see if you agree with this. Like, is it is it a good thing to envision a utopia and try to create that here on earth now um yeah uh, i i i i i want to answer that but i would would you indulge me because i want to make sure um would you indulge me a little bit more on your perspective on ideals because i i kind of am interested in incorporating that in my response hmm well how do you, how do you, well, I, I don't know that I, I don't, I don't know. So you have like, to ask me a more specific question, I guess. Appreci do you appreciate the ideal of like living up to the model of Jesus Christ as a example? Is that an, ex is that a type of ideal you accept? Yeah, sure. Okay. So you accept like things to move towards 
but utopia seems like too much of an ideal. Is that your fear? It's it's not that utopia is too much of an ideal. Um, one is like personal, like I have control over myself to become better and better and better. But when I start aiming that at the society, I get worried that some people are actually maybe engaged in this actual activity right now, and they may not be as smart as they think they are. Engaged in the Building Utopia project? Yes. Okay. And that can actually turn into a disaster because Mm. they don't know what they don't know and they don't have that humility that you were actually talking about earlier. Whereas like in a personal setting, me aiming to be the best version of myself is a little different and not, and not that you can't have big goals. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I just, as I, as I was looking at this, I think it's just interesting to look at it in a, and I, maybe that's the difference. Maybe it's, I get uncomfortable a little bit when people are trying to say a utopian idea as a group. And that kind of sounds it sounds okay. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, that's a plenty good answer for me. Okay. <laughs> um, so I do have a video that kind of goes really into depth on this question. I filmed it with my brother, actually. Okay. Um, it's uh, specifically, it's a review of the, of the giver, right? There's, there's mm. a book and a movie. Uh, I did see that um, thumbnail. Oh, you saw that? Or mm. the, just, <laughs> you saw the, did you listen to it or just the thumbnail? No, I, it piqued my interest. I did not have time to listen to it. I was uh, yeah, trying that's fine. to, just, yeah. That's just curious. Um, so that 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 one, like the giver, presents like the 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 it presents the um, the real the, the hypothetical of a of a utopia gone bad. Right. Mm-hmm. It's the the giver is all about like e- euthanasia. It's like we're building this perfectly sustainable society. But like, you know, the shadow, like uh, on the surface, everything looks harmonious. But then underneath the hood, it's like they're drugging people to reduce their emotions. They're euthanizing children that are sickly. You know, they're 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 forcing people down career paths and not giving people freedom to learn the truth about their past. Extremely controlled, culty society. And they're doing it because, oh, you know, the apocalypse was so scary, like tribalism destroyed the world and we have to do everything we can to combat tribalism, even if that means taking away your very humanity. Right? Mm-hmm. And so it's a very interesting uh, thought experiment on how utopias can go wrong. And in that video, one of my main conclusions was part of the reason utopias go wrong is that their methodology is top down as opposed to bottom up, right? Mm. So top down is control, domination. I'm smart. You're dumb. Listen to me, right? Mm -hmm. That's the top down is an oppressive, you know, forcing everyone into the program uh, utopia. Uh, Yeah. uh, And those types of utopias. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Those types of utopias are usually the ones that can go wrong uh, because the people at the top aren't gods. They don't know everything, just like you said. Um, I think the bottom-up approach is safer. And (laughs) interestingly enough, it uh, coincides with Mormon doctrine, right? Uh, Mormon doctrine says that um, something to the effect of uh, priesthood power cannot be exercised except through persuasion. Right. No oppressive dominion is an acceptable use of priesthood power, but persuasion and, you know, you know, uh, you know, peace, peaceable dialogue. And so I think the bottom up approach, it's it's discourse. It's, you know, uh, good faith debate. It's the collective public dialectic. It's I'm going to persuade you that the vaccine is good. I'm going to persuade you that this utopia is good. And if it's not good, tell us something and we're open to criticism. We're going to tweak it. 
we're gonna and it's voluntary right we're not mm. forcing you to join you voluntarily join the utopic system and that i think that paradigm is much more likely to succeed okay i like that uh so that is the difference then each individual each individual is so righteous that i think mormonism because of their con concept of free agency they're largely a bottom-up religion but uh in in the new testament they had a type of you know they had a they had a type of zion where everyone they had the the collectivism or they had a type of communism right where everyone was donating to the church at the time of peter and there was there was two there was a couple who lied to peter and they only you know they withheld some of their donations right they were supposed to donate everything to the church because that's the law of consecration to 100 percent you know give it to the religious state but they basically deceived peter in their financial you know offerings and the spirit of the lord you know told peter that they were liars and he god basically smote them dead um, on the spot for not you know participating in the program so that's a little bit more top-down force. It's like, do it or die, kind of a... But, mm. you know, Christianity, it's a little bit more brutal. Mormonism kind of softens out a lot of the brutality of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I want to ask you, like, of all of your content that you've created, what are you most proud of or what would you want to promote or point people to? Wow. Wow. That's such a great question. Such a hard question. You can give me it's like top three if that's too hard. <laughs> I think, I think that like people who suffer are the, like the biggest bang for your buck is wisdom for those who suffer. And that, there's the, the Verveke, you know, he talks about the meaning crisis, uh, the meaning crisis is, you know, accentuated for people who suffer. And, you know, there's a lot of people suffering. Depression's going up. You know, people are largely unhealthy for, you know, who knows, you know, modern, you know, diet and activity, a lot of reasons. So I think that my video and my, my you know, me trying to philosophically accept my suffering, I think, I, or at least I hope, that that will provide the biggest bang for the buck. You know, people who don't suffer, you know, it's not going to be that useful. But most, like people who don't suffer, they're probably not even going to connect to it. It's not going to resonate. Hmm. But but for people that suffer, I think that has the biggest bang for the buck. Say that video again. It's called Philosophy of Suffering. It, I think it has an image of a tiger upon it. Okay. What are you... What? What projects are you working on now? You mentioned John Verveke. I noticed that he he commented on your, like, hey, I'm going to try to make this for the regular people. And he was like, I like that project. Go yeah. for it. So, yeah, tell yeah. me about that. Like, how many videos are you planning on doing? And uh, yeah, yeah, that that was super encouraging. Yeah, John Verveke, his content is super, you know, uh, esoteric. It's complex. It's dense. But I think it's extremely valuable um, and it's very much in alignment with my transcendent philosophy paradigm, right? I feel like him and me are like extremely in alignment, but he's like three levels more complex than what I'm doing. And so trying to simplify his stuff is actually a difficult task. Hmm. And it's like a learning, uh, uh, like simplifying it is like, you know, the thing... Um, uh, Einstein said something like, you don't understand something until you can explain it to a five-year-old. Mm. Like, I, I want to understand it so that I can explain it simply. And like, it takes a lot of effort to actually understand what he's talking about. So like, it's a difficult project. And, um, but, you know, uh, like Verveke, you know, he, he kind of put, it was very encouraging because it was difficult. I only did two videos and I kind of gave up. But because of his encouragement, maybe I'll, I'll put some more effort into, you know, trying to do a couple, a couple more videos because his series got, I don't know, he's got at least 10, 
videos on the topic. So yeah, we'll see. Uh, maybe over time, I'll slowly add more and more. So uh, were you, have you been influenced by Verveke? Like, like your stuff, like, or you, did you kind of find him like, holy cow, he's talking about the same thing. Like what? I'm just curious. Uh, like, I think I, I kind of dug into Verveke after I started building some of my philosophic paradigms. Mm -hmm. So I, I already had kind of a philosophic architecture that my blog is kind of like building, you know, sc the scaffolding on all the, you know, foundation. So I kind of already had it built by the time I got into Verveke. And he kind of like goes, yeah, he's, it's kind of like, he reinforces what I already am thinking. I haven't, I haven't found a lot of disagreement with what he says, you know? Yeah. That's cool. Well, I appreciate the talk. Thanks for coming on. And hopefully people can come check out your content that you've worked on. So I find it really yeah. good. I like the oh. whole bridge building stuff. I think that, yeah, honestly, I feel like more people are more alike than different and we've just been focusing on the things we disagree with online more. And so you get this sense that people are on opposite polar opposites, but I just don't think we really are. Even the people that promote themselves as being polar opposite, I don't think they're really that different. I just, um, so yeah, but I like your project. So I appreciate that. And I think it's really cool what you're doing too. Like this, um, channel trying to help people see you know where will you go like that's an important question you know so that's it's a really awesome project to try to aggregate these different ideas yeah well, thanks thanks for participating so anyway mm -hmm. have a good night all right thank you see ya